Yeah, good morning, Professor. Yeah, hi, good morning, Stephen. Good morning, good morning Kazuki. Good morning, Darlene, and good morning, Ian. Um, okay, I see seven people, seven people, um, seven in the collaborate, and let me quickly check how many in our forum today. And I see nine. So, um, yeah, I just hope, you know, um, uh, uh, still two more people will join shortly. Um, so um, let me continue. I mean, uh, I just checked where we should be today. And according, um, we should be as of today, uh, we should be actually uh, in the third topic. We should be in the third topic. So not just third topic, but today we should be doing, you know, um, we should be done already with this and, you know, uh, uh, multiple cash flow. Ah, so we're like, you know, uh, almost like two days behind, two, two days behind, like two. Well, we are actually, as of today, we must be already done, completed with the, uh, uh, time value of money. Let me see when this is, when this was set to, uh, yeah, this is today's topic. So, uh, uh, so uh, let me catch up, you know, on this. But, you know, uh, once again, um, I've been telling you over and over that uh, uh, do not rely on the collaboration solely. Do not rely on collaborate, solely rely on collaborate, because uh, this is only a reflection and review, right? And um, the main lecture, if you follow the main lecture by today, you would be there uh, that I just showed. Okay, so... Um, okay. So we uh, talked uh, pretty much everything about income statement yesterday, but you know, with the income statement, you know, uh, comes the uh, the balance sheet. And I told you, uh, balance sheet is um, the balance sheet is uh, uh, about the uh, capital structure, not about profit, right? I said this over and over. And the line items are completely different from the uh, uh, income statement. So if you look at the uh, uh, balance sheet, the structure is like, you know, um, uh, in two parts, uh, mainly two parts, right? Um, asset side and liabilities and equity side. Asset side and liabilities and equity side. And liability, it means debt, right? It's something you are liable to pay. So it's debt. Equity, you don't owe it to anybody. It, you owe, just owe it to yourself. In other words, uh, the, cap, the capital that is provided by the uh, owners of the, business, of the company. And I said, uh, the, goal, um, the goal of the purpose of the... Um, um, balance sheet is the capital structure. What does capital structure mean? Capital structure means simply the uh, the composition of uh, debt and equity in the total assets. Now, if you look at the asset side, it breaks down into two major components, right? One is, you know, uh, uh, physical assets or fixed assets or real assets or non-current assets, okay? Non-current assets. So it goes by uh, so many different names. So here, so the balance sheet breaks down into, uh, uh, first of all, the asset side assets. and liabilities and equity side. Uh, 
And if you think about it, um, liabilities and equity, uh, so this is the source, source of the capital, source of the funds, right, uh, for the assets. In other words, there are only two sources of capital. In other words, you raise capital in only one of the two ways. Either, think about it, you are starting up a business. And suppose this is something a manufacturing, like computer manufacturing. And to start up a computer manufacturing, what is what is uh, what is crucial? I mean, what is needed in the first place? Of course, to start up a, a computer manufacturing business, you must have the technology. You must have the source technology, right? You cannot just, you know. Um, at least you should be able to build a computer, uh, and you have to know, uh, you have to have that, you know, understanding the knowledge of the computer science and computer engineering. Um, and it's not just you. I mean, if this is a company, right, you must hire the computer scientists and computer um, engineers, right? Um, but that that's you know basically you know um, um, uh, human capital, but before, uh, but even if you have human capital, you cannot. Uh, you cannot produce anything unless you have uh, plant and equipment. Isn't that right? And I've been telling you uh, over and over, I've been telling you the biggest difference between manufacturing and retail or, or and service industry um, is the plant and equipment. You must have plant and equipment, right? Plant and equipment, land and building. Of course, that means you know, uh, plant is a building. It must be put up. It must be uh, built on a piece of land. That goes without saying. So, isn't plant and the building the same thing? No, no. Plant, uh, plant is literally the uh, factory, the plant. The building here. Uh, uh, would refer to the office building or the just the uh, building that you own that you own uh, that you have as real estate. You can you can just simply you know uh, uh, regardless of the uh, uh, your main uh, business, you can just rent it out and earn rental income. But all of this. All of this, suppose, you know, uh, cost, you know, uh, uh, $9 million, okay? It's just hypothetical, you know, it would cost more than $9 million, right? It costs $9 million. And then just because you uh, have plant and equipment, uh, does that mean you can... Um, start the production. No. Uh, first of all, 9 million uh, uh, must be, you know, uh, initially invested to uh, build the plant and put equipment into it, right? Um, but just because you have plant and equipment, you cannot start the production. You have to have what they call working capital. Okay, so uh, working capital is what, uh, so let's say you need $1 million of working capital, $1 million of working capital. So in other words, total, in total, you need uh, $10 million to start up this business. To, okay, total is 10 million, right? $10 million. But then the next question is, uh, 
uh, okay, working capital is you know basically the uh, the capital you need to keep the business going until you uh, uh, until you uh, uh, churn out the uh, first batch of products from your plant, right? So obviously you will need to uh, you will need money to uh, buy raw material, right? Pay electricity, pay utility to run the plant, right? And then you need to uh, uh, pay the workers that you hired, right? Uh, during the lead time, what does that mean? Lead time means you know, the time it takes to uh, uh, put out your first batch of uh, products, right? So the first batch of products, right? And then, you know, after that, you can, uh, from that revenue you generated, you can pay your workers, you can pay for the raw material, uh, you can pay for the utility. But then until then, since you have no sales revenue, how do you keep this business going? Uh, you have to use your working capital. Okay, so uh, this uh, Another name for this working capital is called uh, current assets or liquid assets okay um, and we talked about you know what liquid means liquidity means First of all, how easily you convert um, any asset into cash. So uh, cash is already cash. So cash is the most liquid asset, right? So it will be uh, all these line items will be listed in the order of liquidity. And then uh, plant and equipment, land and building, these are called non-current assets. or real assets or fixed assets or physical assets they all mean the same thing because they are real what's real is physical right what's real is physical think about it real means something that exists in physical form Right? If someone says, if someone says, uh, uh, I saw a ghost, I, I saw a ghost, uh, the house is haunted. <laughs> Nobody says, you know, it's real. I mean, if it is real, you should be able to see it and touch it, and you know, uh, it should be in the physical form. And if it is not in the physical form, it's clearly not a ghost, right? Um, we don't, you know, um, of course, you know, uh, uh, in finance and accounting, uh, we uh, except you know uh, tangible assets and intangible assets, right? Uh, uh, but then you know uh, 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 real means you know I mean intangible assets are not real assets, right? That goes without saying. Like you know uh, intellectual property, intellectual property, copyright, these things you know patent. They are intangible assets. They are not tangible assets. But so we are physical assets. Right, they are real. Okay. Now our next question is then. So we need ten million dollars to start up this business. So where does that ten million come from? There are only two sources it can come from. Those two sources are uh, debt, either debt and equity okay and the debt can break down into short-term debt and long-term debt okay so short-term liabilities long-term liabilities 
And equity is just equity. And so equity is the owner's capital. So, so suppose, you know, you when you start this business, um, um, you can, you know, uh, suppose uh, it can be, you know, you can be the sole proprietor, meaning, you know, uh, you're the only one uh, uh, who solely, right, uh, single-handedly uh, start this business. But then the capital has to come from you, and that's going to be very difficult. So what do you do? Uh, generally, uh, when this business starts, a f you know, a few partners come together. I mean, you know, a few people that um, share the same uh, vision, same goal, they come together and they form partnership, right? They are part, generally partners and they chip in. So this requires 10 million. So they chip in um, and if uh, chip in some capital, their own money, right? And um, but how much can you raise, you know, by uh, chipping in your own money, you know? I mean, uh, suppose you uh, have a house, you have two cars, you sell them all. How much can you raise? Maybe not uh, more than $2 million, right? Uh, that's, and it's going to be a, um, it's going to be a real uh, risk taking, serious risk, risk taking if you are uh, selling all your house, all your belongings, all your cars and everything uh, just to put into business. So um, um, risk sharing, there, there should be some risk sharing. So the partners, right, they chip in. Uh, and if there are 10 partners, they all chip in um, and everyone chipped in like 400,000. Then, you know, 10 partners, uh, from the 10 partners, the, the amount of equity raised is uh, 4 million then, right? Okay. And then, then still 6 million is lacking. So what do you do? You, you will go to the bank and, you know, try to borrow 6 million. But um, in reality, theoretically, this is possible. But in reality, you're not going to be able to raise, you know, uh, uh, you're not going to be able to borrow 6 million from the bank if you are a startup business. Make sense? Why? Who's going to lend you any money? Uh, who's going to lend you like 6 million, right? There's no way, no bank will be taking such a risk because you are just a startup. And what is a startup? Startup means nothing but a big question mark, right? Startup means nothing but a big question mark. Startup is a big question mark. You have no track record, no sales revenue. I mean, you have no track record. So this startup is basically a big question mark. So who's going to lend 6 million? It's not possible. In reality, that doesn't happen. Unless you can put up, unless you can put up like $6 million worth of collateral, right? Or even $8 million worth of collateral because they don't, uh, they don't loan out uh, max, I, 100% of the collateral value, they will probably loan out, you know, just about 80%, maximum of 80% of the collateral value, right? So it's, you know, uh, uh, it's almost, you know, uh, uh, impossible. It's not. Uh, um, another thing you can do is sell bond in the bond market sell bond for six million dollars once again this is impossible you are just a startup you're not listed in the uh, stock market you're not listed in the bond market you are not accepted there right there's no way you can raise you know six million uh, either from the bank or from the uh, bond market there's no way you can borrow but you know um uh that's uh that's why there is venture capital. If there is venture capital, they can uh, either invest six million 
and they they can uh, they can take participate in this as a partner, right? So in other words, then they 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 invest six million in equity. They become part of the owners, part owners, right? Or they can lend you six million, right? Either way, um, but then then they are not part owners, but they are just you know uh, uh, creditors or lenders. But um, but although realistically, you know, uh, you cannot borrow from the bank or from the bond market, we'll just assume uh, hypothetically that you are able to uh, get the loan. So then out of those $6 million, you know, let's say uh, uh, $4 million is long-term debt. So long-term debt means, you know, it, it would be either... Uh, Let's say three million is a bond, uh, okay, let's let's just say five million. You could get five million in long term debt. Let's say three million is in bond. You sold bond for three million, and two million mortgage. Right? In other words, you got it from the bank. Why? Uh, well, by using uh, you are acquiring land and building, you know, plant and equipment, and they are like you know nine million dollars, you know. Uh, uh, So let's say uh, this plant and equipment is six million. Let's say plant and equipment is uh, six million, and land and building is three million. Okay, then maybe you know uh, you got two million. Uh, you got mortgage for two million, and probably the two million is the building, right? Um, but either way, um, that makes, you know, uh, that's five, four, nine, and then short-term debt, one million. Again, here's the thing. Oh, so uh, short-term liabilities or current liabilities, long-term liabilities, long-term debt, uh, so they are liabilities and they are uh, 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 they are both debt, but actually, um, yeah, they are both debt. That's true. Uh, but the short-term debt and long-term debt are treated differently. Why? Um, when we say capital, right? When we say capital, um, and later, you know, um, not in this class, but in uh, like you know, advanced class, like you know. Um, Finance 230, uh, uh, you will see uh, the ratios like you know uh, uh, debt to equity debt to equity ratio uh, and total debt to total um, uh, total debt to total assets ratio. But you know when we do uh, debt to equity ratio. Um, we only include long-term debt, right? We only include long-term debt. Uh, in other words, long-term debt is treated, uh, long-term long -term debt is uh, treated as capital. Long-term debt is treated as capital, equity is capital. So when, um, when we take the ratio like, you know, uh, ah, I have to, uh, uh, ah, God. When we take ratios like um, total debt to total 
SS ratio. Now think about it. This is what uh, this is very important because out of your total SS, how much is uh, the debt, total debt? Um, this is basically what's called capital structure because uh, capital structure means how much of the total SS came from debt and how much of it came from equity. So in our example, simply in our example, again, this thing. In our example, our total equity is uh, 10 million and our total debt is 6 million, right? So it will be 6 over 10. We can easily tell that's 60%. 60% of their, uh, this company's total assets came from uh, debt. That means you know, 40% is equity, right? Uh, so that's capital structure. If 60% is debt, 40% must be equity, 60 to 40. That's, you know, uh, capital structure. And this is not a, uh, uh, this is not a nice capital structure. I mean, too much debt, right? You would rather have 60% equity and 40% debt, right? Uh, even 60% equity, 40% debt is like the uh, uh, it's like the borderline. I mean, you know, uh, you are pushing the limit of a uh, uh, capital structure that is still um, uh, sustainable. Uh, what should I say? Um, optimal, optimal, uh, optimal capital structure is usually found somewhere between 70% equity, 40, 30% uh, debt, and 60% equity and 40% uh, debt. Right? Somewhere in between there. And why is that? Uh, why is optimal uh, capital structure important? Because at optimal capital structure, your um, uh, uh, your earnings per share will be maximized and your uh, uh, return uh, will be maximized, right? And the uh, stock price will be maximized. But, you know, anyway, it's not the, uh, uh, it's not the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, uh, item to talk about in this. Um, so, but then, uh, they also do, okay, so then uh, we can tell, oh, so 60% is debt. And then 40, that means, you know, uh, uh, equity, if ever, you know, uh, equity to total equity ratio, in other words, here. Uh, if this is debt ratio, this is equity ratio, then it must be 40%, right? And then you might think, oh, so then uh, debt to equity ratio must be, Debt to equity ratio must be uh, then six over four. No, this is wrong. Why? Uh, it's actually five over four. Why? When we take debt to equity ratio, um, we don't include. We don't include. Uh, uh, where am I? We don't include uh, short-term debt. This is not included. Short-term debt is not included. Okay, it's not included in debt to equity ratio. It, only the long-term debt is included in the uh, uh, debt to equity ratio. Why? Because long-term debt and equity are considered capital. They are long-term capital, whereas. Uh, 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 short-term uh, debt is not capital. You remember I told you before, the line between the uh, long-term financial market and the short-term financial market is one year, and the long-term financial market is called capital market, whereas short-term market financial market is called money market. Right? Remember that? That's why in the long-term capital, uh, in the capital, uh, capital doesn't include short-term Okay, so everyone 
is clear about that. Uh, first of all, uh, this is the big structure uh, of the uh, uh, this is the big structure of the uh, uh, balance sheet, and then uh, uh, the minor line items. We're gonna go over that uh, later. It's not important. Uh, uh, liabilities and equity is the source of the asset, right? That's the source of the fund for the cap uh, for the assets. Think about it. Uh, when you after you raise this ten million dollars through debt and equity, then it, you can use that fund to acquire plant and equipment, land and building, and then use uh, you use nine million out of that. Uh, 10 million for uh, uh, physical assets, right? Like fixed assets and hard assets, right? Real assets. Uh, and then remaining, you can use remaining 1 million as uh, the uh, working capital. Okay. And then, uh, so here we need to also define what asset means. There are three uh, uh, levels that the asset can be defined. First of all, uh, uh, in accounting, they say asset is what you own and liability is what you owe. That's the uh, very basic definition they use in, uh, in the accounting. Asset, what you own. Uh, liability is what you owe. Uh, it's, not, it's not entirely wrong, but it's insufficient. Why? Uh, that definition is then lacking the explanation uh, uh, about equity. Then what is equity? I mean, if assets are what you own and liabilities are what you owe, uh, what is equity? Is it what you owe? No, equity is not what you owe. Owe to the shareholder. Oh, yeah, 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 sure, of course. Uh, so here, uh, you're right. Um, uh, that's that's E N, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, you're getting 0 0.5 for that. Uh, but let's let's take a look at it from the owner's perspective. Looking at it from the owner's perspective, uh, today is. January 12th. Um, owners, think about it. The, the, the firm, firm is, as I told you, the company is nothing but a vessel, right? It's it's not a living animate entity, but it, it's a legal entity. But it is, you know, uh, basically um, uh, the owners set up this company to use it as a vessel to generate uh, income and funnel that income, uh, funnel the profit to the owners, back to the owners. Uh, so from the owner's perspective, yeah, owners own all these assets and owners owe the debt to the lenders. But the owners don't owe this to anyone. They owe it just to themselves. They owe it just to themselves, right? If you owe it to yourself, that's what you own, actually. Isn't that right? Equity is what the owners own, free of debt. In other words, yeah, of course, that's that's what equity is. But then why do they put it on the, uh, if that's what they own, uh, why do they put it on the, uh, uh, the right-hand side, not on the, uh, it's because that's the source of the capital. Equity is the source of fund. Right? Source, and I told you, I've been telling you, um, asset side, assets are uh, uh, what you own, right? Um, so, um, and that's, but that, it's also, you know, how the, how the capital that was raised through debt and equity is held in what form uh, this is uh, 
The $10 million raised through debt and equity is held in the form of plant and equipment, land and building, right? $9 million of that. And $1 million is held in working capital. Okay. Uh, and since equity is the source of capital, they put it here. Also, another reason, okay, now let's look at it from the company's perspective. Not from the owner's perspective, but from the company's perspective. Company is inanimate entity. It's not a living being. But still, um, uh, the company is managed by the management, right? It's managed by the management. So uh, we can consider the management as the company. Uh, the management is, and you think, this is important. You might think, isn't the management the same thing as the owner? No. Management and ownership are separate, right? That's the concept of modern corporation. You don't have to be a manager. Um, I mean, think about it. If this all $10 million came from you, you are the sole proprietor. But you are not a computer expert. You are not computer scientist or computer engineer. How can you manage the company? You own the company, but you don't manage the company because you are not the expert in computer uh, manufacturing. So what do you do then? You hire a manager who is an expert in computer manufacturing, as well as uh, an expert in business administration and business management, right? So management is basically uh, uh, hired. Uh, so the management is hired to serve the best interest right? To serve the best interest of the owners. That's the management. And of course, you are the owner, but you are Bill Gates, and you are Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. Well, what can you do? I mean, you, you will be, you will manage, right? You will become the top manager yourself because you're the owner who can say no i mean um you have 100 percent ownership nobody can as long as you have think about it 51 percent ownership nobody can vote against you because the rest of the ownership is only 49 percent right and if you have 51% ownership, super majority, then no one can veto your decision. So if you are Steve Jobs, if you are Bill Gates, and uh, you own 51% of the ownership, and you can appoint yourself to you, and then you are the chairperson, you're the chairman, because uh, you can vote yourself to that position, right? And then um, as the, um, um, the ownership is represented by the board of directors, unless this is a, a sole proprietorship, unless you own 100% of the ownership, there will be directors. Who are the directors? Directors are the representatives of the uh, shareholders. And of course, to become the directors then uh, to become directors, then you have to gather, you must have already some significant uh, share in the in the ownership, like, you know, 11%, 9%, you know, uh, whatever. And then uh, even with, you know, 11%, probably you can become one of the uh, uh, 10, uh, 20 uh, directors. And that's called board of directors, right? The represent this... Uh, assembly, assembly of the uh, these you know um, uh, major shareholders uh, will be uh, is called you know board of directors. Usually in, on the board of directors, it's usually the uh, institutional investors, institutional investors that are on the uh, 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 board of directors. Something like you know uh, wealth wealth management firms, asset management firms, right? 
or uh, you know hedge funds or I mean if they own you know significant shares uh, and Bill Bill Gates and you know Steve Jobs themselves uh, didn't own like you know uh, 51 percent single-handedly they own probably maximum of like 11 12 13 percent but you know they just gather uh, together the friendly friendly uh, uh, forces friendly forces and then uh, they vote together they vote in unison and you know um, uh, and then uh, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates can uh, uh, control like 51 percent and then you become the chairperson and you can even appoint yourself to the CEO position does that make sense hmm? in the modern corporation ownership and uh, management are supposed to be separate but you know uh, with the majority vote, right? Super majority vote. Uh, the head of the ownership, which is the uh, chairman, chairperson, can also become the CEO. CEO is the head of the management, right? The the management consists of you know uh, CEO, CFO, chief financial officer, right? CFO, CIO, chief information officer, or CEO, chief operating officer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this is hired management. But the management, hired management, uh, although um, if one of the uh, um, shareholders, one of the uh, shareholders um, is the best person to run the company, right? Then he can become, he or she can become uh, also the CEO. You just need to, uh, as long as you can, you control the super majority, you um, uh, just appoint yourself to the uh, CEO and you just get 51% vote. That's it. More than If it is more than 51%, better. Right? Does that make sense, everyone? Hmm? Yes. Okay, only one person? Huh? <laughs> Where, where's the rest of everybody? It does sense, Professor. Okay, great, Randy. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so as I said, asset uh, is defined as what you own and liabilities is uh, defined as what you owe. But then there was a little you know, problem defining what is equity. Um, because equity is already what the owners own. Uh, but again, from the company's perspective, from the management or the company's perspective, uh, equity is what the company owes to the owners. Right? So that's why, um, no, that's how it is defined. But that's the first level of definition, assets uh, and life. Second definition, assets this is exactly what uh, it is. Um, assets are defined as assets are defined as uh, liabilities plus equity. That's what you know. That's called accounting equation. Accounting equation uh, means simply total assets equals to the total liabilities plus equity. Right, um, and on the third level, on the third, and that that simply means you know, uh, liabilities and equity is the source of the capital. That's where the uh, fund came from, source of the capital, and assets are use of the capital, how that capital was used. Okay, and then on the third level, uh, this is very important. Assets must generate income. Assets must have income generating capability. Assets must generate income. If it doesn't have any income generating capability, it has uh, it its uh, its value as an asset is zero. Right? It's just like this. If you have 
a hundred square feet of land in midtown Manhattan, right? If you can have hundred square feet of land in midtown Manhattan or in the middle of Arizona desert, where would you rather have hundred square feet? Hmm? Anyone? If you can uh, have hundred square feet. Manhattan. Yeah, in Manhattan, of course, in Manhattan. Why? We all know if you have 100 square feet in Manhattan, it's got an income generating capability. I mean, uh, it's an empty lot, but in an empty lot, what can you do? I mean, you know, um, first, even if it is an empty lot, you can park some cars there and uh, you can, it generates income, parking space, right? 100 square feet is not a big deal because 100 square feet is 10 feet by 10 feet. In a, in ten, in a 10 feet by 10 feet square, you can probably park three minis, three minis. Mm -hmm. uh, or park just one, one uh, full-size van, right? Uh, but if you build a 10-story par parking structure, if you, even if you park, you know, uh, three minis, it generates income for you, right? Uh, uh, if you build a 10-story parking structure on it, it will generate a lot of income for you. So it's got an asset value. Whereas 100 square feet in uh, middle of Arizona deserts, nothing. It has zero income generating capability, right? Everybody knows that, right? It's not a, um, so uh, assets must generate income, right? You cannot say 100 square feet in uh, Arizona uh, you cannot call it uh, asset. And also, uh, there are non-performing assets. Non-performing assets are exactly the assets that don't generate any income. Why? Uh, something like old uh, plant that is no longer in use. And you, you can find a, a lot of smokestack manufacturing. I told you, you know, uh, in the U.S., if you go into, if you go out to the Midwest or if you go out to the uh, uh, central uh, Pennsylvania, uh, coal, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, some old towns that are dying on the verge of demise. They are slowly decaying. Why? In the past, there used to be industries there, factories, plants there, smokestack factories, right? The smokestacks that, you know, uh, emit uh, the, you know, black fumes, you know, uh, uh, polluting industries, right? But they, uh, like steel mills, steel, steel mills, you know, uh, but nowadays they are uh, shut down. Why? Because they get uh, uh, U.S. imports still from uh, other countries that make steel uh, cheaper. like Australia or, you know, uh, 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 South Korea or um, Japan or uh, China used to uh, export a lot of steel, but then, you know, uh, uh, not anymore because, you know, uh, uh, because of this, you know, uh, carbon issues, you know, China uses, you know, uh, uh, still a lot of coal burning, you know, uh, uh, fossil fuel burning. Uh, and then, you know, uh, EU and the uh, United States have, you know, uh, issued that, you know, uh, I mean, after Biden administration, during uh, uh, Trump administration, um, uh, it was a political reason, you know, I mean, still it's political reason, but, you know, uh, uh, Trump wasn't a uh, champion of the uh, climate. Uh, protection, you know, environmental protection. He was actually a polluter. Uh, Trump was a uh, 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 advocating dirty, you know, dirty polluting industries. But Biden administration is back uh, with the rest of the world for clean energy and, you know, uh, environmental protection. And uh, Chinese, you know, still uh, are made by plants that burn coal and, you know, uh, basically, you know, uh, polluting. So there's a, you know, like a political pressure to, and, you know, uh, uh, 
So not uh, and China made a lot of money, you know, uh, uh, exporting cheap steel to U.S. Uh, and then why did U.S. steel industry uh, uh, go into uh, uh, you know demise? Because of course competition, the price of uh, there is no cost advantage. I mean, uh, uh, it would cost more, much more to uh, produce steel in the US. So, but in the, uh, even until 70s, those towns were prospering. But those steel mills are in ruins now. It's a very sad, sad picture. But if you go to like uh, small Midwestern towns, even, you know, in New York, a state, go to small towns, Pennsylvania, what used to be, you know, steel town, no more. What used to be a thriving, prospering small towns are no longer, you know, uh, it's all, you know, in ruins, dilapidating, but the, those still mills, they still, the plants are still there, but they are non-performing assets because they are not generating any income, right? They are they are just you know abandoned and you know left to decay, right? Um, wow, it was this big. I don't. Okay. Um, so the point is. Um, uh, three three ways you know three levels that the assets can be defined one what you own what you you know two um, assets equal uh, liabilities and equity three uh, assets must have income generating capability so then here uh, so using these think about it uh, I um, in uh, Excel I put them uh, broke them down like this and I don't uh, the main lecture explains, you know, everything about these line items. And since we don't have much time, I'm not going to go over this in the collaborate session. Um, liabilities, you know. Um, anyone have a question? Someone had a question? Or was it my echo, echo of my voice? <laughs> Did someone was trying, was someone trying to ask a question? Hmm? No? All right. So then, um, let's think about this. Using, uh, using this, you know, $10 million worth of assets, right? $10 million worth of assets, of which, you know, $4 million was equity, right? $4 million was equity. Now, Ten million dollar assets and assets exist. The sole purpose of assets, assets are basically the tool, the vessels to generate income. So ten million dollars of total assets uh, exist solely to generate income. So. Um, and then. So we go to the uh, uh, income statement, and then uh, our suppose our operating. So the first first level of profit is operating profit, and let's say this operating profit or EBIT is twenty million dollars. I mean two million dollars, not twenty million. $2 million. And then after paying interest and taxes, right, uh, our net profit is $1 million. Okay, that means, you know, uh, interest and taxes, you know, I suppose interest is, you know, let's say uh, 600k. And let's say, uh, why, 
to and taxes, that means 400K. Okay. Now, so this is the final fruit. This is the final outcome or the final fruit of the uh, workings of these $10 million total assets. Does that make sense? This is the, uh, this 1 million is the final outcome, final outcome of this $10 million total assets. Also, it's the final outcome of this $4 million equity. Makes sense from the uh, uh, stockholders, owner's perspective, right? Um, if this is the final product, this is like the uh, intermediate product or uh, initial, primary, initial outcome, right? So now here's something I need to uh, also um, bring up because Because um, in the uh, in the operating activity, right? I told you, you know, uh, in the income statement. Um, excuse me a second. All right, so um, um, uh, it is uh, one o'clock already. So I think this is the best time to take a 10 minute break. So let's take a 10 minute and uh, reconvene at uh, 110. Okay, let's reconvene at 110.
All right, we're back. We're back. Um, so, um, if you if you look at the uh, income statement again, you might find. Okay, uh, it's not. Okay, it's not here. Uh, this one doesn't have it. But um, if you look at another, yeah, another example, you'll find something called, you know, gross profit, gross profit. So what is what is that? And I said, um, the initial outcome the initial outcome of the operating activity is operating profit or EBIT, right? But then what is gross profit? I mean, uh, is gross profit, uh, if you look at it, you will see gross profit after subtracting, uh, after CGS. In other words, uh, instead of subtracting Instead of subtracting, um, okay, I'll, I'll have to read this. This is so. Now think about it. You need to subtract both CGS and OPEX, direct cost and indirect cost from income, right? But sometimes they just subtract only CGS first. And the result of subtracting CGS, uh, so the, the result of subtracting after C, uh, subtracting CGS, they call that gross profit. So you know you can tell it's incomplete. Oh, yeah. That cannot be called profit because yet because it's just incomplete. Gross profit is incomplete, but they say this is the uh, uh, the first round of profit. Uh, I would say yes and no. I mean, yeah, of course you uh, you subtracted you know the uh, direct cost. Well, what about indirect cost? Huh? What about the indirect cost? Unless the indirect cost is minimal, unless the indirect cost is, you know, uh, insignificant and minimal, right? Uh, gross profit would, wouldn't mean much. Suppose CGS is relative, direct cost is relatively small, but the indirect cost is huge. What if that's the case? Huh? What if that's the case? Indirect cost is huge. <clears throat> if someone says, you know, uh, I mean, uh, 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 you are, uh, potentially you are an investor. I mean, you are potentially uh, considering to potentially inv invest in this company. And then, so they are giving you a presentation. They are uh, giving you a presentation about their profit, uh, profitability. And so they are saying, you know, our revenue was this. Our revenue was uh, $10 million. And our direct cost, our CGS was, you know, uh, uh, $5 million. So, uh, our gross profit is $5 million. So it's like, you know, uh, our profit margin is 50%. Are you going to buy that? Huh? Are you going to buy that based on the gross profit? No, of course not. Why? Because if they are not, if they are hiding their uh, indirect cost, if they are they hiding their uh, OPEX and just uh, just focus on the, uh, or glamorize on their gross profit, then you should suspect their ulterior motive. What if, think about it, their, uh, their revenue was 10 million, that's good, uh, 
CGS 5 million. So the gross profit is 5 million. But what if their operating expenses were 6 million? What if their operating expenses were 6 million? And they are not talking about that at all. They're not, they're not saying anything about that. Just talking about gross profit, right? And then you should say, what, then what was your operating expenses? And then think about it. After $6 million of operating expenses, then their operating profit would be negative 1 million. Negative 1 million. This is why I'm saying that gross profit is not really a reliable indicator of the profitability, right? It's not a reliable indicator. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, only one person. What about the other? I mean, there are like, you know, uh, nine people here. Only one people, is, only one person is following. What about the others? What about you, Andrea? Andrea, are you there? Angel, are you there? Huh? Stephen. Yeah, I, yes, I sir. You. Yeah, that, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, good. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for confirming, uh, confirming uh, that and uh, also uh, your, your attention as well. You're, you're paying attention. I can, uh, that confirms it. What about you, Kazuki? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All righty, but you know, you, you seem rather very, uh, <laughs> You seem very, rather very passive. Uh, Kyle, are you there, Kyle? Hmm? Leslie, are you there? Yeah, Kyle. I'm here. Yeah, I'm just running it. Oh, yeah. I'm here, for you, but my yeah. connection is not the best. Your what? I, I said my connection is not the best, but oh, I hear okay. you and yeah, I agree. I mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, uh, uh, if you had difficulty uh, with the connection uh, during the collaboration session. Remember, at, uh, uh, after the class, you know, at least by the end of the day, I post uh, the live session, uh, collaboration, recording of the uh, collaboration session. So please, you know, make sure you watch that again. All righty. Okay. So, okay, you're welcome. So uh, watch out for the uh, gross profit. Don't, don't get misled by it. Okay. But back to our um, operating income. As I said, this is the initial outcome of the operating activity. In other words, this is the initial outcome of your uh, total assets. Okay, using $10 million worth of total assets, you produce the profit of Two million. So that's like, you know, input output, right? That's like, this is the output. This is the input, right? Of course, it's not entirely uh, the input because input gets used and input transforms into output. Uh, uh, your total assets are not exactly input in that sense because input is like raw material, right? Raw material uh, uh, labor and capital, but this is, you know, uh, 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 but the capital doesn't go away, right? Uh, raw material gets, uh, turns into, uh, raw material turns into, uh, uh, the, the product, right? And, uh, uh, so it disappears. I mean, it turns into product, but the capital and labor, uh, is uh, contributing, capital and labor con contribute to the uh, output, but they don't themselves, they don't uh, burn themselves up. They don't, you know, uh, completely use up themselves, right? <clears throat> but anyway, so you can consider uh, uh, that as input and uh, consider this as out. And also, this is the final outcome. Net profit is the final. So here, I said at the beginning, I said at the beginning, uh, what is the, uh, uh, um, how does the uh, firm, so we are looking at 
return on investment from uh, a micro micro uh, perspective, right? A micro uh, perspective, micro view. In other words, from the firm's perspective, how do they um, how do they measure their how do they measure their ROI? And I told you it's either or return on assets, return on equity. Okay. So return on equity is what? Uh, it's basically how much output is there? How much output did our equity produced? Okay. And from the uh, shareholders perspective, from the owners perspective, this is very uh, crucial. Because the uh, think about it. Our profit was 1 million, right? Uh, so uh, let me give you return on equity is basically net profit, net profit or EAT, right? Over equity, right? I can rewrite it as Okay, and then uh, so in our example, it's one million over four million, right? Which is twenty five percent, right? One over four, twenty five percent, right? Isn't that right? Uh, yeah. One over four, that's 25%. That's really a good return. I mean, for the uh, shareholder equity investors, right? For the equity holders, uh, our equity return, 1 million. In other words, by for investing 4 million into this business, right? We got $1 million return, uh, $1 million profit. So the return is 25%. This is a very good um uh, return it's a very good return um and clearly you know uh um the shareholders will be uh uh you know uh, excited about it now then what is the uh, return on assets actually return on assets have uh two formulas why? Uh, first, um, yeah, the final outcome, the final outcome is profit, right? And profit is a result of the workings of the total assets, right? From the equity holders' perspective, uh, uh, profit—they uh, don't have to care about what you know. Uh, go, um, they don't have to care about uh, the other part of the uh, the other part of the total assets. They only care about their own investment, which is the equity. And profit belongs to profit belongs to only to equity holder. The owners. Yeah. The owners or the equity holders, right? And uh, who was that who said that? Leslie. Leslie, okay. So Leslie, uh, I'll give you 0 0.5 for that contribution. I didn't ask that question, but you know, anyway, that that was a uh, uh, confirmation that you're paying attention. Um, so it only makes sense to uh, you know, um, do, you know, take the ratio uh, between the uh, uh, EAT, net profit and equity. Um, 
uh, for return on assets. Now think about it. Anyway, this four million, uh, one million dollar profit is the result of the workings of ten million dollar assets. Isn't that right? It's the result of uh, the workings of that you know plant and equipment, right? And the working capital of uh, plant and equipment, which was you know uh, nine million, and the uh, working capital of one million. So total assets of uh, 10 million. So uh, you would, so the final outcome of the uh, uh, total assets, so profit over uh, total assets or EAT over total assets. And then we know this is, this is, this will be 10% because it's 1 million over uh, our total asset was, you know, uh, uh, that's 1 million over 10 million, right? 10%. Uh, But you know, uh, clearly, you know, um, uh, equity equity holders or the shareholders won't even bother because equity holders, from the equity holders' perspective, they care more about the productivity of their equity because that's their investment, not the total assets. But then from the, uh, uh, so, um, but from the uh, uh, debt holder's perspective, think about it. Debt holder, uh, the profit doesn't belong to the debt holder, right? Bond holder or creditors, lenders, profit doesn't belong to them. But this is a uh, roughly the, um, it can give them uh the profitability or the productivity of the total assets. In other words, remember, I, uh, I, I used this analogy before, I believe, the tree analogy, like fruit, apple tree analogy. Do you remember that? Um, uh, do you remember that? I told you, right? I gave this analogy before. Um, basically, uh, a company is like a... Uh, uh, a tree, a business is like a tree, uh, an apple tree, right? And you are the owner of this apple tree, right? And you bought this apple tree. The apple tree is like $10 million. Now, you bought it with uh, $4 million of your own money and $6 million of debt. Right? Remember? So this this apple tree is you know worth ten million dollars. Um, Six million is uh, debt, right? The bank has bank in, uh, that means bank loaned six million. Four million is your own money, your equity. So at the uh, in in fall in October, November, October maybe you know September October uh, apples you no. Know, uh, the tree bears apples, you know, a lot of apples. Right? This is the outcome or the output, right? Of your vessel, right? Of your, you know, uh, so the tree is like the company, the plant and equipment, and it bore, it bears uh, apples. And so for you, uh, for investing 4 million, and let's say the apples are 2 million before interest and taxes. So that's operating profit or EBIT. And after interest and taxes, paying interest and taxes, it's one million. 
Okay. So from, and this 1 million belongs to whom? It belongs to you. So for you, you would want to know return on equity. You calculate that. Uh, but from the bank's perspective, this 1 million doesn't belong to the bank. Uh, bank looks at the total value of your apple tree and how much final outcome the apple tree gave you. So the bank would be interested in looking at ROA. Make sense? But then again, think about it. Uh, why would the bank be so, uh, even if they calculate ROA, uh, even if they want to know ROA, ROA is calculated this way, uh, profit over total assets. But that's, that total assets doesn't do any good to the lender, to the, to the bank, to the lender that total, because they don't get any of that. It doesn't belong to the, uh, so uh, for the lender, the better, better measure is the better measure is uh, EBIT using EBIT over total assets, right? And if you use EBIT over total assets, then that's 2 million over 10 million, 20%, right? Now think about it. From the bank's perspective, this makes more sense because at least, at least this includes, at least this includes, if it includes the interest that, that belongs to them. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So uh, from the lender's perspective, so there are two versions, two versions of ROA. Most textbooks talk about only this. Most textbooks talk about only this, right? But again, you know, uh, that, that would only be uh, the point of view. That would only reflect the point of view of the uh, uh, equity holders because that, you know, uh, uh, EAT, uh, belongs to the uh, uh, equity holders. Uh, but from the lender's perspective, they would want to look at this, the second uh, version. Okay, does that make sense? Hmm? Yes. Yes, yep. Okay. All right, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Yang. <laughs> at least, <laughs> I'm afraid uh, if you, so, this is not obviously, you know, you don't do this for fun, right? Uh, this is not a subject that would be, uh, 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 that would be fun, you know, uh, to, you know, entertaining, right? This is not a subject that would be entertaining. Uh, I try to make it as much as possible, but there is no way. Uh, I know some people are uh, distracted. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, it. Bear in mind, it, it's certainly not entertaining, but it, requ uh, it requires a lot of brain power, right? You have to be able to uh, hold a thought, and uh, you have to stay focused, and uh, uh, you should be able to uh, um, retain the analytical reasoning and logical reasoning right uh, uh, consistently and that 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 makes your brain very tired uh, but if you if you can hold on to it if you can hold it um, that that really you know uh, kicks off your brain I mean your brain gets um, uh, the analytical reasoning exercises, you know, logical reasoning exercises. That's what uh, 
makes your brain um, push the envelope. So actually, math is why well, that's why math is so important because math uh, would make you um, your brain. Uh, math is all logical reasoning, basically. Logical reasoning and analytical reasoning. Math is not just doing you know uh, crunching the numbers, right? That's accounting. Crunching numbers is accounting. Math is you know about the reasoning behind it, why it should be done this way. Right? Why it is done this way? Okay. Um, so uh, that's return on equity and return on assets. And another thing. Uh, finally, uh, let's think about it. So we started out. Uh, so let's think about it. We started out. Um, I think I'll have to. Uh, erase everything here and we already talked about it a little before okay so uh, I don't think, you know, uh, I don't think I need that anymore, you know. Um, so we know equity was uh, 4 million. But you know, this four million was as of when? I mean, we had four million dollars of equity as of when? Hmm? Anyone? The starting point. At the starting point. Yes, you're right. Yang, right? I'll give you a, yes. another zero point five for that. Yeah. The equity value of four million was as of the starting point. In other words, at time zero, right? That you know, for, um, that's called book value. Okay, book value of the equity at time zero, right? Let me. What I was trying to do was. Uh, Equity at time zero was, you know, uh, uh, four million, right? And let's say, um, and one year later, right? One year later, I mean, we operated for one year, and we came to the EAT of one million. Right? So that's as of when. The company operated for one year and they ended up with, you know, one million dollar net profit. So this was as of when? At the end of first year. At the end of the first year. So this is EAT at the end of year one. Make sense? This is EAT at the end of year one. So then think this is not going to be distributed right to the owners but clearly it is it belongs to the owners so if it belongs to the owners right and it uh, basically it will become retained earnings uh if they pay out dividends uh after after dividend after paying out dividend whatever is whatever remains is the retained earnings. If they don't pay out dividends, the net profit itself is entirely retained earnings, right? So then, then think about it. If EAT belongs to the owners, uh, in terms of nature of capital, in terms of nature of capital components, in terms of nat uh, uh, nature of capital components, in, 
uh, how should I put it? In terms of capital components, right? Uh, nature of capital or capital components, what does that mean? There are only two types of capital. I've been telling you, there are only two types of capital. Isn't that right? Only two types of capital. What are they? Debt and equity. Debt and equity, yes. Yes. Again, yi yang, right? I'm going to give you another 0 0.5 for that. Why only yi yang? What, what, what's, other people, what, what's other people doing? What are, why only yi yang? Huh? Other people are, what are you? Uh, are you dead or are you deaf or are you dead? Huh? Or are you, um, other people are not responding at all. Um, yes. Um, uh, well, there are only two types of two components. It's called capital component, right? Either debt or equity. So then EAT, in, in terms of capital uh, component, what is it? Is it equity or is it debt? Equity. I told you. Equity. Yes, equity. It's equity. Why? Because it belongs to the uh, uh, it belongs to the uh, uh, stockholders. It belongs to the owners. It belongs to the equity holders. So uh, it is okay. Yeah, I'm giving you another 0 0.5. It is equity. In other words, it is just internally generated equity. There are two. Think about it. Uh, two types of capital, paid in capital and internally generated capital. Paid in capital is something like this. Original, uh, this original, um, this four million is paid in equity, paid in capital is paid in because it was paid in by the uh, um, original uh, owners. This is the capital that was paid in, right? Raised, raised through uh, IPO or raised through sale of stocks, or just footed, right? Just footed, put up by the original um, investors, original partners. They are all paid in, right? That's paid in equity, but then EAT is internally generated equity. In other words, uh, generated by operating activity, generated through the operating activity of the firm. It's equity because it belongs to the owners, but it's not. Um, it's not paid in, is generated by the company's operating activity. So then think about it. Uh, at the end of year one, ay, ay, ay. at the end of year one, the equity position will have changed. Isn't that right? At the beginning, at time zero, there were $4 million and this is paid in. Paid in capital. And this is generated by operating, operating activity. Right? So then, I told you it will be it will be retained within the company as retained earnings. So then, if it is retained earnings, then it will be added to the original equity base. So equity at time one will be then five million. Make sense, right, everyone? It does. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Now, now let's think about it. Let's think about uh, 
I'm going to have to <laughs> erase. Oh, oh, what did I do? Eraser, not the uh, highlighter. Now let's, this is aggregate, right? Total, right? Aggregate. Let's think in terms of per unit, per unit or per share, per share. Okay. Suppose this company has, uh, this company has 100,000 shares outstanding. The company has, so this is aggregate. Aggregate amount. And think about the per share. Now, if there are, an, uh, assuming, uh, 100,000 shares outstanding. I want to write outstanding, 100,000 shares. Then, if you divide this by 100K, right, that will give you per share value. Isn't that right? So the equity value at time zero was 4 million, but uh, per share, it will be simply what then? Uh, $40, isn't that right? It will be $40 per share, right? 4 million divided by 100K, $40, right everyone? This isn't, this is not even math, it's arithmetic, it's very easy, isn't that right? And what is this called? This is literally per share price. So this is called book value per share at time zero. Book value per share at time zero, right? And then of course, book value per, uh, that means you know, uh, price of the stock by the book, right? And then uh, this EAT, of 1 million uh, that's total earnings right aggregate right earnings that's EAT so if you um, then think about it divided by 100k the per share value will be ten dollars right and what is this called you divided earnings after taxes or EAT. In other words, you divided by you divided EAT one by number of shares. So this must be called earnings. You divided earnings right after taxes by a number of shares. So this should be called what? Earnings per share. Yes, this is what is called earnings per share, literally, earnings per share at time one. Make sense? Now then, think about it. Just by adding book value per share at time zero, which is $40, adding $10 earnings per share to that, it will be fifty dollars, and that that makes sense because oh, at the beginning of at the beginning of the year, the earnings per share, uh, the book value was book value per share was forty dollars, and the company earned ten dollars per share. Earnings per share is ten dollars at the end of year one. So then, the book value per share at the end of year one must exactly reflect that, must be exactly $50, which reflects, right, that $10 per share. And also, uh, if you, we know, ah, oh, come on. We know the EAT, ugh. 
we know the uh, equity equity at time one is five million, which is you know uh, uh, four million plus one million EAT. So you divide also you divide that also by uh, one hundred thousand, right? One hundred k. Then that's fifty dollars, right? The same thing, which is also which is also fifty dollars by adding book value, you know, uh, uh, earnings per share at time one to book value per share at time zero, and this is called then. This is called book value per share at time one. Does that make sense? So this reflects exactly the uh, uh, the change in book value uh, over one year, right? Uh, resulting from uh, the earnings per share, right? Uh, which was generated by the operating activity. So basically, this is the uh, book value. I mean, uh, market value. Once again, market price may deviate from this. Now, think about it. Do you think the market price will be, in this case, in this example, remember ROE was 25%, remember? Right? The ROE, I erase that, right? Uh, but ROE was 25%, right? With 25% return on equity, uh, what do you think? Will um, Will the market price at time one, P would represent market price, will it be greater than or less than the book value per share at time one? Which one do you think? Will it be, will the market price be greater than or less than book value per share? Hmm? This is quite logical greater. reasoning. Huh? Greater. Greater, greater. Yes, greater. So uh, yeah, Yang, uh, I, I'm going to give you um, another 0 0.5 for that. Carl also uh, write something in the message box and answer. OK, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me check. Let me check. Yeah, Kyle. Uh, greater than, okay, so I'll give you another 0 0.5, Kyle. Uh, yeah, of course, why? Market price, the difference between the market price and the book value is the uh, expectation, right? Market price reflects a lot of expectation, right? I mean, if... Uh, everyone is, uh, and the market will be excited about uh, the, the uh, market will be excited about this stuff. I mean, as long as it has, you know, uh, better than market average, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, if uh, annual market average, right? Uh, oh, come on. If the uh, mark average market return, annual average market return uh, uh, is, let's say, like 10%. And this company did 25%, then the market will be excited about this company. I mean, if you are an investor, uh, you would definitely put your money into a stock that's doing better than market average then to the company that's doing below market average. Don't you think? Hmm? So then, uh, because of this, uh, uh, the price will be pumped up because there will be a huge, uh, there will be a, a strong demand 
there will be a strong demand for um, this stock. So although um, the market price will reflect, the market price will reflect that positive expectations, right? The market price will most likely be uh, greater than book value per share. Okay. Uh, also, you can say, I mean, uh, the, the mar uh, market is market price is overvalued. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, just because it is greater than the uh, book value per share, uh, you cannot say it is uh, uh, overvalued. I mean, uh, in accounting, I mean, just by accounting, uh, uh, just by accounting uh, criteria, you can call it uh, overvalued. But uh, there are three different prices. There are three different prices uh, uh, when we talk about an asset value. Uh, three different prices. One is the uh, is the market price. And two, book value. Three, intrinsic value. Intrinsic value. Now think about it. Financial assets bear fruit always in the future. That's the nature of financial assets. Financial assets do not bear fruit today. They bear fruit in the future. That's what investing is all about. When you're investing, you are trading today's consumption with the future consumption. Isn't that right? In other words, you are saving money. When you are saving money, there's a trade-off between saving and consumption today. Isn't that right? That saving goes into investment, right? What you save, you invest. So uh, why do you invest? Because in the future, it will give you bigger fruit, bigger consumption. In the future, you can consume more. So you are trade. investing is basically a trading trade, trade between today's consumption and future consumption. You either you enjoy this money today or enjoy this money tomorrow enjoy more money tomorrow or in the future right so valuation of valuing any asset uh, is basically a present value of its future cash flow present value of its future cash flows isn't that right so um uh book uh, intrinsic value is basically that intrinsic value is the present value of its future cash flows in the future right and the book value is based on the past it's always based on the past think about it you can have book value because you have the data past data you have the data of uh, uh, eat of 2021 you cannot have eat net profit data of 2022 because 2022 is not over I, i've been telling you um, January is the earnings season. There will be a, a earnings report coming out from the second week of uh, January or, you know, uh, middle of January. Um, uh, uh, because they, they will compile the, they will be, uh, they will have compiled the fourth quarter data, fourth quarter data of 2021. So uh, uh, when we have year one data, year one data, uh, EAT, uh, uh, that's basically already passed. And book uh, uh, equity value of um, uh, time zero, that was already one year ago. So even the uh, uh, equity value of year one, end of year one, it's already past data, passed, right? So book value is basically based on the past data, right? Market price is just people's, you know, uh, market participants, people's expectation, anticipation. It's not uh, expectation um, uh, in this case. You know, I should be careful about the word expectation because expectation is actually a uh, uh, simple average uh, of the past. But, you know, 
um, uh, think about it. Most market participants, you know, uh, most you know uh, people who play stocks. Not, you know, I would use the term play stock, play stocks, because they don't know, they don't have any training in finance or economics. They just play stocks. They buy and sell, buy. And sell. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. Um, they play stocks, and uh, they don't have any. They don't know what is intrinsic value. They just uh, looking at oh, uh, they made twenty five percent. The ROE is twenty five percent. So this is greater than average market. So uh, they just obviously it's rational. Of course, it's rational. You would form a uh, uh, positive expectation about this stock, but that's you know uh, that's still rational. Uh, behavior, but again, they know nothing about the uh, 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 intrinsic value. Uh, uh, market price, uh, when there is a positive expectation, market price tends to be, it will have to be greater than the uh, uh, book value, but whether it is really overvalued or not, you will have to compare the intrinsic value with the book value. If the intrinsic value is greater than the uh, uh, book value, uh, then it is uh, not overvalued. If the intrinsic value is greater than the book value, um, and the market price is, it's not uh, uh, too much overvalued, right? Intr um, if the, uh, um, so I'm gonna talk about that, um, now, it's already 2.05, so uh, we'll take a 10-minute break and reconvene at 2.15, uh, and then uh, uh, there will be a time, you know, uh, in another topic, uh, I'm going to talk more about that. All righty, let's take a 10-minute break, okay, 10-minute break. Uh, no, uh, Ian, to answer your question, you know, uh, uh, no, the answer is no. I'm going to, uh, but, you know, I'm going to uh, talk about that when we come back.
All right, we're back. We're back. Um, so before we went into break, uh, Yang asked, posted a question in the chat box, and uh, okay, I will share my. So the question was, you know, in the chat box, I said already no. Uh, Yang's question was, does book value equal to par value? Uh, no, my answer was no. Why? Because let me uh, show you this. Um, par value means, you know, bond as a par value, okay? Uh, and we talked about that uh, uh, in the, uh, when we talked about the bond, right? Uh, I said, in, in case of bond, the par value is uh, maturity value or face value. And uh, so it goes by many different names, par value or face value, maturity value or redemption value. And uh, Except, except for municipal bond, except for municipal bond, they are all, par value of the bond is all $1,000 in the US. Okay, uh, 1,000. I don't know what, you know, par value is in other countries, but you know, uh, in the UK, maybe, you know, uh, 1,000 British pound, maybe in Europe, uh, in uh, Euro, uh, European Union, right, where you know, uh, where they use euro, could be one thousand euros, but you know, uh, I don't know, I haven't checked. Uh, in case of bond, but in case of stock, so in case of bond, bond uh, par value is one thousand dollars, which is the uh, maturity value, the uh, you know, uh, what you get at maturity. But in case of stock, uh, par value is the IPO price. In case of stock, right? Par value is IPO price. So that means what? Uh, in case of stock, par value has very uh, par value has no meaning. Why? Because nobody wants the stock price to remain at the uh, IPO price. They want the stock. Uh, uh, so after IPO, the price must right go up. Of course, sometimes you know they go down after. Uh, uh, IPO, you know, right after IPO, uh, they go up first and then go down drastically. But overall, if this is not a frivolous IPO, I mean, um, there are some IPOs that were uh, like, you know, uh, 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 conceived with ill intent. There are IPOs of the companies that were uh, totally, you know, uh, 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 a fake IPO. I, I wouldn't say fake IPO, but you know, uh, a company that has no uh, lasting power, a business model that has no lasting power, but they just, uh, they just, you know, uh, uh, go public just to, uh, because that IPO, uh, it can generate huge, um, uh, huge, you know, uh, 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 proceeds, right, from IPO, for example, you know, uh, um, and then they sell, I mean, the uh, uh, initial, uh, initial investors or initial um, owners, after, you know, uh, that boom in IPO, they sell, and they, they take profit. And then after they sell, it just plummets. It takes a nosedive. And then hardly recover. 
that after that hardly recover. And this is usually, you know, uh, um, a foul play. In other words, you know, they do this just to, uh, uh, and the, bus that the business is, you know, really uh, nothing but, you know, uh, uh, a paper company. I mean, it, it doesn't even have any viable business model, uh, but they just, you know, uh, do this to, uh, uh, you know, uh, make a big buck. So anyway, um, if it is a uh, legitimate, you know, uh, a business with a uh, legitimate business with viable business model and lasting power after IPO, it may go down, but, you know, it will eventually uh, uh, take its course, right? Uh, the regular, you know, uh, so uh, book value isn't par value, okay? And also uh, in stocks, uh, there are two types of stocks. I don't know if you, uh, th this will be all explained when we get there. But, you know, uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're kind of going uh, in advance. Um, but stocks, uh, equity, right? Equity is, you know, uh, Uh, another name for stock, uh, two, two types, common stock or common equity and preferred stocks. Preferred stocks. Common stocks, this is the real uh, stock. Preferred stock is like a, a, a halfway between equity and debt. Uh, preferred stock is still stock, but, you know, uh, uh, preferred stock doesn't have any... Uh, uh, voting right. Uh, and for preferred stock, the par value means something because preferred stock's uh, price doesn't move that much. It will just, you know, uh, it moves, but it will generally uh, uh, show mean reversion or, you know, uh, gravitate back to a par value. Uh, it won't move away that much from par value. I mean, it moves, but, you know, it uh, it will be uh, not uh, drastically uh, taking off from the uh, par value. Okay, so that's, you know, uh, my answer. Um, so I think uh, the next thing we need to do is actually uh, I want to uh, wrap up this. Okay, I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, 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 promissory notes and accounts receivable tomorrow. We don't have time for that. Absolutely no time for that today. But at least we can do this. You know, we have like only two minutes left. But, you know, uh, let's, I told you, when once you download this, you know, delete all the highlighted cells. So if you have highlighted these cells, you know, then uh, it's not a difficult thing. It's easy. We'll just, you know, uh, find out. So income, first of all, you know, primary source of income sales revenue, and some investment income. There's returns and allowances, you know. Returns and allowance, uh, that's obviously it must come off, right? It must come out of the uh, uh, returns, right? So customers return, so you will uh, uh, refund them. So it must be subtracted from the sales revenue. So I already put it in negative, right? That parenthesis means negative. Uh, I didn't put parentheses. As you can see, I put minus 3,500 and automatically Excel puts parentheses around. That means, you know, uh, uh, it is cash outflow. It means it is, you know, uh, 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 negative or cash outflow. That way, uh, I don't have to subtract this. I can just add them up using... See, auto sum. Oh, no, no, not there, not there. Using auto sum here, you select this. Using auto sum, you just uh, hit enter. And this gets, uh, it's, it's summing everything above it. So it's automatically subtracting because this is negative. Now, uh, CGS, right? Directly uh, related to production. Uh, now, uh, this is, Retail business, I mean, uh, 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 
in the uh, uh, the demonstration was here the demonstration was uh, manufacturing case of manufacturing right manufacturing typical manufacturing right uh, CGS um, I mean uh, breaking it down into like um, uh, factor co uh, factor price like you know uh, uh, direct input price like you know uh, co uh, labor capital and raw material uh, that is manufacturing's case but in retail you don't you know you don't have to retail in retail you just sell the products pr manufactured by the manufacturer produced by the manufacturer so you don't have to uh, uh, break it down into uh, factor prices but then you know uh, uh, typically this is accounting uh, as way well. uh, uh, because in retail, all your inventory is only finished goods, right? All your inventory is only finished goods. Uh, you have uh, beginning inventory, uh, net purchase rather than new purchase. Net purchase is the correct term, net purchase. Uh, and then uh, ending inventory. Okay. Um, of course, there's returns and allowances, but returns and allowances in this case is our returns and allowance. Uh, what is an allowance? Allowance is a, uh, a discount given to the channel members. Discount. For example, a retailer buys from the uh, uh, manufacturer a large quantity. So there will be a volume discount, something like that. You know, uh, if you uh, buy more than uh, 10,000 units, then we'll give you a 2% discount. That kind of you know, discount is called allowance. Okay, so uh, if we are, if you are a retailer, uh, there won't be allowances, but just returns because you know, in, uh, if you're selling to the uh, customers, right? In B2C, uh, there's no allowance, just, you know, it, there can be discount. But as I said, allowance is the term that is used only within channel members. So if I'm a wholesaler, uh, I bought from a uh, manufacturer, and then I uh, resell it to the retailer. Because I'm the wholesaler, I sell it to the retailer. And uh, I can get I can get you know, volume discount from the manufacturer, which will be allowance, and I can give uh, also a volume discount allowance to the retailer if they buy big uh, a lot from me okay so this returns and allowances is our returns and allowance in other words we return if if you are the retailer we return to the wholesaler or if you are the wholesaler we return to the uh, manufacturer right so uh, although this is negative but think about it. This whole thing is expense. This whole thing is, right? Because they are expense. They are cost to us. They are expense. This this whole section, this whole section is cash outflow. From the cash outflow, if it is negative cash outflow, actually that's uh, cash inflow, money coming back to us. Right? Make sense, everyone? Make sense? Hmm? Yes, Professor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All righty. So then think about it. Um, and there is one thing uh, interesting there. Uh, one thing that is, uh, ah, this will take more time. So I'm going to have to uh, uh, talk about this tomorrow. But we can just sum everything using auto sum. So I will still need to uh, uh, do this tomorrow. Uh, auto sum, and we get the CGS. But I will, uh, tomorrow, I will talk more about this. Um, the main lecture has already uh, explained it. All right, but that's all the time we have. So uh, uh, I'll call you today. Uh, have a great afternoon. And unless, um, does anyone have any questions any, at this point? Any questions? All right, if there are no more questions, uh, uh, you know, uh, have a great afternoon. Uh, 
uh, and uh, I will see you tomorrow. And don't forget, the uh, quiz one is due today. Okay. Oh, tomorrow. I'm sorry. Not today, tomorrow. Okay. So uh, tomorrow. I mean, uh, you can get started even tomorrow. But you know, uh, if you get started, do it ASAP. You know, uh, uh, maybe you know, uh, uh, some people may wait until uh, the lecture tomorrow. Uh, but you know, if possible, get started. Uh, get a head start, please. All right. Um, take care, everyone. I'll see you guys tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Professor. All right, take care, Stephen. Take care, darling. Take care, Ian. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye, take care, Leslie. Yeah, take care, Leslie. I'll stop sharing, stop recording, and sign up.